Hello everybody, this is Dan Bigman. I am your GPR professor from LearnGPR.com, a division of Bigman Geophysical. And today we're gonna to ask a question, or answer one, about what steps to use when you process your GPR data. Okay, what steps should you use to process your GPR data? Lots of folks out there have, they get confused, okay? If you're new to GPR and you're wondering, should I process my, my raw data? Should I not process it? How much time should I spend on it? What function should I use to process the data that I have already collected? Um, these are important questions that you might have, and it can get very confusing. You get very different opinions out there, often depending on uh, who you purchased your software from, or if you know who you purchased your GPR from. So I'm going to try to clear some stuff up here because, you know. Data processing is often looked at by new people as like the big scary monster on the hill uh, that you don't wanna have to deal with. In reality, data processing does not have to be overwhelming. It can be actually pretty simple to think about. And you don't have to spend that much time while processing your data to get a big effect from, you know, from, from filters and, and, and other steps. So we're gonna kinda of go through this pretty quickly, but. Here's the way that I think about it. There is a law of diminishing returns when you do data processing for GPR. Okay, law of diminishing returns. So here's the way to think about it. On this side, you have um, effect, right, or benefit. Okay, you have benefit. Down here, you have time. And so the way I think about data processing is like this. It's dying on me. Where you get a lot of benefit for a little bit of time, right, exponential, and then you get incremental benefit that takes a lot of time. Okay, so a lot of benefit in a short amount of time, and then incremental benefit for a long amount of time. And so what do we have here? Right? What are we looking at here? Well, here's the types of things. And I'm going to kind of put this you know, line through here where you get kind of incremental versus exponential benefit. Start down here. We're going to start with um, 1D data, actually. So 1D, incremental, right? So we're looking at DWOW functions or DC filters. This is usually done while you collect the data. Most systems automatically will use these filters to correct for drift. And we have other videos uh, out there on YouTube uh, that you can check for these. I have one about one-dimensional filters, how to use them, what they do, including DWOW filters and DC filters. Um, so that's 1D. These critical, but usually done for you automatically. So 2D. Right, 2D. So where do you get a lot of the benefit? Right? Time zero corrections. Um, background and band pass filters. Uh, what else? Gains. Okay, so gain functions. What else? Time zero, background, band pass, gains. Certainly, although this could take some time, is you would get, you could get um, topo corrections. Now, what's nice about topo corrections is if you have accurate GPS data in the Z dimension, right, the vertical dimension, elevation dimension, this could be very quick. It could be the matter of just a couple buttons. So that's really nice because it will set everything where it's supposed to be if you've been working in a varied topographically varied landscape. Time zero, background and band pass. Gains, uh, topo corrections. Um, trying to think if there's anything else jumping out at me. Uh, oh, of course. So you do hyperbola fit. Okay, and this is going to allow you to estimate depth because the hyperbola fit is gonna give you wave velocity it's going to give you depth. 
you need to be careful using this. You need to be careful using all, all of these, but um, you want to do it correctly. Okay, 3D. So there's sort of two things that you can do in 3D that can help with time slice imagery. And those two main ones are going to be migration and maybe Hibbert transform. Now, it's not always... I mean, Hibbert could be used, both of these can be used for 2D. They can be used to look at certainly Hibbert or 1D, but often we're getting the effects for a 3D plot. And so what it's going to do is it's going to correct for your distortion, the migration will, and then the Hibbert transform um, is going to shift all of your polarity data to absolute amplitude data. And that'll help when it plots from a top-down perspective, your time slices. So in 3D, these two filters can be very helpful as well. Once you get beyond this scope, right, we start to get incremental, and you have things like deconvolution, you know, uh, uh, Fourier kind of stuff, um, you know, other mathematical uh, uh, filters that you can use. These often take more time to use and they may only give you incremental benefit. Something to be aware of, an important caution. Everything that you do to your data removes information. So you always want to be careful that you don't remove information that you care about. People say, you know, they look at some of my data sets and they say that they're ugly, and I say, but they're real. Okay, so when I can pretty up any data set, real pretty, but I might remove most of the stuff that I care about that's in there. The other thing is if you over-process your data, you might not be representing the difficulties of that particular project site. Everyone always wants a really pretty data set to say, here's the uh, uh, things we were able to find. When in reality, you might be over-promising just through the beauty of your data set what the contractor might actually see underground. When in reality, you might have missed a lot because it was a problematic data uh, a project site, and that should be reflected in your GPR data. It's okay to show how problematic the site was. So, hope this is helpful. This is how I think about it. This stuff does not take very long. It doesn't have to take very long. This may only be 15 to 60 minutes with a huge benefit, okay? You don't need every one of these on every data set. If you do it the same way every time, probably doing it wrong. You wanna pick and choose the ones that are correct to use for any given GPR data set. Maybe you don't need 3D, okay, that's gone. It's gonna take you less time. Okay, maybe you don't need to do a topographic correction. Okay, that takes less time. Maybe they don't care about depth and they only care about horizontal. You might not need to do that. I mean, there are things to consider. So, hope this was helpful. You know, in this case, it could take hours. So, you can get a lot done in a short amount of time that's exponential, and then a little bit done in a lot of time, and we call this uh, incremental, I guess is what I called it for. Incremental. So that's the kind of break you know, over here uh, in these two sides. So I hope this was helpful. Uh, if you like it, then please hit the like button. Uh, put a comment below if you have another question for us that you'd like us to answer. It's something that came up in one of our uh, live workshops recently is they were kind of overwhelmed and they were wondering, well, how much do I have to process the data? Well, you don't have to do all that much to get a big effect. And it's kind of that misconception. So uh, go to learngpr.com and check out our upcoming workshop dates and, uh, and put in your name and email address and you can get our free introductory video uh, um, you know, right, right away. So hope this was helpful. Thank you so much. Good luck surveying and I will see you next time.